So you have a retirement home? Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome all of you out on this uh, snowy night. Again, let's bring the college to order. And uh, I'd like to welcome all of you again out on this snowy night. The college consists of the following format. We first have the brief announcements period. Then we have our speaker who speaks. Then we have a question and answer period. Then we have our infamous rebuttal period where you can speak about either on or off the subject. I'll send you a check. Or, and at the end, the speaker gets the last word. We generally have to be out of here by 8.45, so the cousin restaurant closes at 9. There are only two rules. One is one fool at a time, and two is no person with the tax. Tonight's moderator will be Andy Anderson. I'll be your somewhat convivial host, Sergeant Arnold. Uh, we will open the mic to yes. our speakers for tonight, the and we will lead in. Let's see what we've got. Introduce him. Okay. Joshua Gray. Joshua Gray is a candidate for Cook County Board Commissioner, a Chicago native. <coughs> He believes every community has the potential to thrive. He has proven to be a man of service, a champion of the people throughout his lifetime. Joshua has worked tirelessly, both alone and in partnership with other community leaders and elected officials to address issues that negatively affect Chicago communities. These include gun violence, youth unemployment, and unequitable state funding for underserved areas. So, if there's no more announcements, please uh, give a hand to our speaker, Joshua Gray. Welcome to the college. Thanks so much. All righty. We, we got more battery and power for you. We get another one in there if you need Um, good evening, everyone. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> good evening. All right. <laughs> um, before I begin, I want to thank everyone at the College of Complexes for the invitation to speak today. I also want to recognize uh, Jim, uh, who is uh, one of my staff members who's always with me everywhere I go. Hi, Jim. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, I am running for Cook County Commissioner of the 3rd District. It consists of 14 different wards. These are including Old Town and Gold Coast to the north, south through downtown into Bronzeville and Hyde Park. It also goes west to South Shore all the way to Ashburn and includes everything in between. I have, I have been going door to door since October. And the question I always get is, what does a commissioner do? <laughs> um, this question is neither naive nor misinformed. It's actually disappointing. Not on the end of us, the voters, but on the end of the commissioners. If people have no idea what a commissioner does, it is ultimately the commissioner's fault. So going back to the original question, what does a Cook County commissioner do? Oh, got it. Got a fresh battery. Got a fresh battery. Sorry about this. It should have been done before. Thank you so much. <laughs> testing, testing. <laughs> Thank you. You guys hear me now? Good. <laughs> I was about to say that. So going back to my original question, right? What does a Cook County Commissioner actually do? Well, Let's go, let's get into some history first. After all, I am a former teacher. The Board of Commissioner, Commissioners 
is made up of 17 different commissioners who are elected from individual districts in the county. This is a practice that began, that began in the 1980s. Commissioners approved the budget of individual counties that, uh, of, that, uh, that of the elected officials that also assess, collect, and distribute property taxes. They vote on other taxes, such as sales tax, which a lot of us are paying tonight, <laughs> beverage tax, fuel tax, and of course, the infamous amusement tax. Yes, they tax us for having fun. They vote on ordinances or laws that govern the county. This mainly includes public health, public safety, the forest preserve, <laughs> records, and maintenance of county highways and bridges. The board is presided over by the Cook County Board President, who is currently Tony Preckley. The seat I am running for, the third district seat, is the only county seat that has Chicago and no other suburban areas in it. It is a seat that has been held for 30 years by Jerry the Iceman Butler of the Impressions. Jerry is currently the oldest standing elected official in the state in his 80s and is set to retire this November. So this is a historic election. This seat can go from the oldest elected official to the youngest elected official, would be me at 34. So who am I? Right? I'm a lifelong Chicagoan. I was raised in Hyde Park, where I received both a solid public school education and a private school education. I participated in organized sports and social activities. I lived in a community with businesses and opportunities, but more importantly, a community surrounded by neighbors who cared about me and others around them. I currently live in a similar community in South Shores with my wife, who's a, who is an attorney, and our four beautiful, brilliant kids. I started my career as a community organizer and a young adult minister for a well-known Catholic priest by the name of Father Flager. In my job as a community organizer, I focus on young adults and employment opportunities for ex-offenders. I also help <coughs> in the economic development in our Gresham and address the gun violence that plagues our city today. It is at this time that I would like to take a moment of silence for the vi victims of Parkland shooting. My heart, my heart goes out to the families and loved ones in Parkland. My past work with ex-offenders was what led me into my next career, education. That is because most ex-offenders say that their turning point occurred when they started to prioritizing school, deep not prioritizing school. So I became a teacher later a dean, and finally my career, uh, and finally a assistant principal at CPS, Chicago Public Schools. I left CPS to go work for Arnie Duncan when he left the Obama White House. Under Arnie, I worked for the Emerson Collective, where I managed millions of dollars of grant funding for youth programs in Chicago. I spent the last 16 years taking on juvenile reform for the county as chairman of their advisory board, a position I was voted into. It was during that time that I was, that I was the eyes and ears of the county board concerning the juvenile detention center. As chairman and in, the, in, in, in a front row seat, I got to witness the mess that they call the Cook County system. A system of zero oversight, 
wasteful spending, an overcrowded jail system, an antiquated hospital system, and an excessive tax system that pro provides zero tangible services for the thousands of dollars taxed away from our citizens. Simply put, Chicago, with the county's help, has become the city of overtaxation. People have been leaving our county in droves. The cost of living in Cook County is too heavy of a burden to bear. Recently, my wife and I had to rethink our budget because our mortgage went up 27% last year. Now, 27% is only about $500 to $600 more on our mortgage, but $500 for a family with four kids is a choice between buying groceries or paying bills sometimes, or paying bills and putting our, our kids in programs. The, the bigger problem is that if two people with stable jobs, like myself being an educator, and my wife being an attorney, if we are struggling with our budget, then what is a single mother doing? Or a retired person on a fixed income? What are they supposed to do during this time of overtaxation? The simple truth is that we give too much money to a county system that gives us nothing back in return. That is why I decided to run. We need people in the office who understand the average person and their family. The next, the next two years are very important in Chicago because as a member of the board, I have the ability to help vote out the individuals who are overtaxing us. This year, we choose commissioners. Next year, we, we choose the aldermen who controls the taxes for the entire city. This is important because the county and Chicago are in trouble. Beyond being overtaxed, we are struggling to pay pensions every year. And we continue to make cuts to key areas. I believe in a balanced budget that protects pensions and sustains the county, but not at the expense of programming and resources for our communities. When you have to choose between taxing people or cutting jobs, you are, you are in a state of an emergency. That is why we are where we are now. Firing employees or cutting crucial services is not the answer to every budgetary crisis. Instead, being innovative and finding new revenue is the key. We have to work with our state legislators to reassign where and who, our tax, who, who we are taxing. Because Chicagoans need relief. For instance, we can try taxing foreign investors as opposed to taxing Chicago citizens trying to go to the movies or sports games and something they call the amusement tax. We have tons of people and companies who come to our state to invest. In 2015 alone, we had $20 billion in foreign investment in Chicago alone. But these same people also get tons of tax breaks. It's time to cut the brakes and start having companies and rich individuals pay their, pay their fair share. There's also our management issue of issues such as gambling, in which the state of Illinois is losing revenue brought in by gamblers to neighborhood states. The absence of casinos in Chicago has cost millions if not billions of dollars. Gaming has not always been popular. But we cannot continue to enrich the economy of neighboring states at the expense of our residents. Revenue from gaming will provide crucial support to Cook County in, in, in a distressed budget. And lastly, 
the infamous marijuana. States like California and Colorado are benefiting from decriminalizing of the drug. While youth are still being put in detention centers for months on end for the possession of marijuana. It's time we do as well and use the revenue we gain from legal legalization to make this city and make this county better. Beyond that, we should look at past overlooked ordinances, like the Responsible Business Act, that most of our current board members voted for in 2014. If you do not know what the Responsible Business Act is, please Google it, very important. With a few minor changes to the Responsible Business Act, we may be able to pass an ordinance that may work for the county. So now let's talk crime. Crime costs the county two and a half billion dollars a year. Two and a half billion with a B. Not to mention, we have some of the highest incarceration rates among youth and young adults in the county. It costs us $150 a day to hold an adult in, uh, uh, in jail and $500 a day to hold a minor in a detention center. We simply cannot afford to continue this incarceration at this rate. Part of the issue is that we take a reactive approach to crime rather taking a proactive approach to crime. We need to invest in our youth on the front end so they have never become criminals or step foot in a courtroom. This is because, and most people, this, this, this is because most people don't know this, that most crimes in Chicago are committed by kids who are 16 to 24 years old. Justice reform recently has made strides in the past couple years. However, there is still work to be done. The overall goal should be the shift from punitive practices to a, re a, a rehab or rehabilitative pr approach. That is why we should do the following things. We should work with Chief Judge Evans in fair sentence reform for first time offenders with no criminal record. We need to begin to find alternatives to incarceration. We need to expand what Judge Evans is doing in North Lawndale with community court. We need, to, we need to subsidize options such as uh, boarding schools for school age kids. Some kids just need to be taken out their environment. 18 to 24 year olds should be able to get a trade at Job Court. And if all else fails, we increase ankle monitoring and probation, but this time with an educational component to it. Because as a former educator, I can tell you that education changes lives. <laughs> Lastly, services. When was the last time you walked through the South or West Side neighborhood? It is, a tro it is troubling to hear police sirens, see so many houses boarded up, and see a lot of vacant properties. County services have been absent from my district alone for 30 plus years. The fifth ward, where I live, but more specifically, the 71st Street, where my campaign office is, used to be a vibrant, bustling business district. The ghost of past development is seen by going a block down <coughs> to a block line with empty storefronts, abandoned buildings, and going out of business signs. If you go even further, you will see an empty parking lot where a neighborhood grocery store used to be. Sadly, this is a constant reminder of the struggles that are associated with life on the south 
and west side of Chicago. But the county can help. Programs for our kids, jobs for our youth, home ownership, and business opportunities would breathe life back into these areas. First programs. An idle mind is a terrible thing to waste. I know we all heard that. The same thing goes for our kids. We have kids that are that are, are robbing houses while we're at work or at the grocery store. We have kids that are sticking up elderly for their cars. I am proposing to create a mentorship program composed of a network of mental health specialists, sports clubs, and other forms of education to keep these kids engaged. We have to give our kids things to do, and the county can help do that by expanding good programs, such as Experimental Station in Woodlawn. Next is jobs. We need to bring back the county summer help program. Putting money into young adults' hands so, so they don't continue to rob people for minor things like cell phones is a solution we strongly need to consider. Lastly, community ownership. The county can make it easier for residents to get good homes and business loans by taking a page out of Kurt Summers' book and encourage banks that accept dollars to offer low interest rates to businesses and homeowners. An innovative, an innovative and progressive plan will help revigorate our neighborhoods, our city, in our county. We are only as good as our weakest communities. As Cook County Commissioner, I will have the ability to initiate and put these things into plan and into action. <coughs> so on March 20th, if you want a better Chicago, a Chicago where you're not taxed out of your homes or out of your communities, a Chicago where we're sending our kids to programs and not prison. A Chicago where we, we're giving services rather than cutting them. Then on March 20th, punch 91 and vote for me, Joshua Gray. Because I have been and I already am working for you all. I want to thank you for listening. And at this time, I will take any questions that you may have. Thank you. All right. Um, tell us a little bit more about how to contact you, your website, and your or anything like that. Just get a quick plug for your website and campaign site. All right, yeah. So my campaign website is uh, www.citizens with a s citizens for Joshua Gray .com. So citizens c i t i z e n s for f o r Joshua J o s h u a Gray, like the color, G R A Y dot com. How about your Twitter handle and Facebook page? My Twitter handle is Josh Gray at 2018. <laughs> and if you are, if you're on Facebook, my Facebook is Joshua Gray for Cook County Commissioner. Okay. Um, my I have a campaign office. If you want to reach me, my number at my campaign office is 312-857-6421. That's 312-857-6421. Um, we got go ahead. Question, questions. Is that rare? Could you uh, maybe this? I can make this a two-part question. Um, could you give us your assessment of, of <coughs> Mayor Rob Emanuel? What you think of him? What he's done for the city? Whether he's good for the city? And also, uh, well, you know, we probably all think that um, uh, Trump is, is a disaster, but uh, so that's not really as much of a question. But what would you think also of Obama's presidency? Do you think that he changed the country? Uh, you know, dramatically for the better, or, or what? What do you think of, of those two politicians? All right. Uh, first, Rahm Emanuel. Um, so I'm I'm running on a county race, uh, which Rahm really doesn't affect that. Um, but as a voter and a citizen of Chicago, um, I'm worried with Rahm Emanuel at at the at the, the whip. Um, I think Rahm is great for downtown. 
Um, not sure if he's great for the south and west side of Chicago. Uh, that is, uh, has been yet to be seen. Uh, I'm worried what he's doing with, um, uh, with a lot of stuff, including um, just a recent article with uh, allowing uh, undocumented workers being able to vote. I'm worried about that. Because um, it, it often dilutes a lot of other people's votes in Chicago. Uh, now, Obama. Um, Obama is, is one of the reasons that I'm here. Uh, he said in one speech, if you don't like what you see, you pick up a, clip, a clipboard and you run. Um, I preach to a lot of people, because uh, a lot of people care about what happens nationally, the presidency. Uh, but I, I wish a lot more focus would go on local elections because, lo because local elections affect us more than national elections. And they're more immediate. Um, so yeah, that's how I feel. Right there. All right. Yeah, Mr. Gray, the uh, our federal government is cutting back on funding for public transit. And the state of Illinois just cut their funding for public transit. And the public transit in Cook County is paid for by the sales tax levied by the Cook County Commission. And you say you're going to cut back on taxes. So that, does that mean there's going to be less CTA service and a fair increase because you don't want um, so yeah, uh, I, I didn't say uh, I would cut back on taxes. Uh, what I said is that uh, I believe in fair taxation. I don't believe we need any more revenue. Um, if you look when Todd Stroger was office, he had a, a $2.2 billion budget. Uh, President Preckwinkle has been in office maybe six years. She has doubled that, uh, the ask amount from us. Next year, she's asking for $5.36 billion. So we went from $2.2 billion to $5.36 billion. That's a huge jump. Um, we, I don't think we need any, any more taxes. I think we need to uh, take care of the money that we have, uh, make sure it's not uh, wasteful, we, we make sure we're not wasteful in our spending, and make sure that we have oversight of, of county programs. Now, transportation is definitely a city thing. It is not a county issue. Um, uh, the only thing we probably do uh, is probably collect the tax and distribute it. Uh, we have nothing to do with transportation uh, for the city. That is a city, city issue. Yes, sir. All right. I guess it's going to be a contest for Cook County Board President, what's your view on that? So you said uh, Cook County Board President? Yeah. You asked me who, am I, who, am I, who I am supporting? So what's your perspective on that? Um, you know, I really don't have a perspective. I know who I'm going to vote for, um, but I don't have a perspective. Uh, I'm really, one, I will work with whoever the president is. Uh, because I'm running for people in my district. So whoever the president is, I will definitely work with him or her after this, after this election is over. Yeah. Not saying who you would vote for. I, I, you know what, I'm not going to say who I'm voting for. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you're talking about trying to keep taxation fair. But the county also has a huge uh, unfunded pension fund. Mm -hmm. How are you going to handle that? Where are you going to get the revenue to pay, start paying that down? Um, so a couple things. So the pension is probably the biggest, biggest worry that I have uh, on the county level. Um, by uh, 2020, you will have, we will have more pensions to pay in the county than we have employees. Um, that, that's a problem. Um, I think that, that, that the, the county does have enough money. 
uh, I believe that the county is very top. Uh, we have a lot of patronage jobs. If you look at the assessor's office alone, uh, he, he is known to hire family members. And, and, and in 2015 budget, um, he had 37 people in his office making over $100,000. That's a lot. 37. Um, if you look at uh, the president's current budget, she asks us for $397 million out of, the, out of the county budget. She never talks about cutting her own budget. She currently, well, in 2015, she had 47 people making over $100,000. I haven't even gotten to the contracts that the county goes to, uh, uh, that the county writes, uh, or the hospital system, which is also very top heavy. Uh, we have a lot of money. Uh, the problem is we're very top heavy. But the issue is she blames a lot on the services and brags a lot about cutting the services for the least of these. Uh, she recently said in the talk that she cut, she bragged that she cut 10% of the county's budget, saving us $12 million. Again, I repeat, she has a, 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 a budget of $397 million and she just created a new bureau under her, which is the Bureau of Economic Development. So the elected officials are not looking at their own staff, at their own people at the top. We have a lot of managers that manage other managers. We, always, we are always quick to cut services on the lower end, the public defenders, the state's attorneys, when we should be looking at the top heavy county. Uh, so again, I believe that we have enough revenue I believe that uh, that we do something about crime. That, that costs us two and a half billion dollars a year. That would give us that's that's also additional revenue. Um, I don't think we need more revenue for the county. I think we have enough. We just have to manage it well. Yes, sir. How about doing something as simple as just making the general ledger public for the county? I, I definitely agree. Uh, and I think that's something that, the, that we can take from the Obama White House. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but uh, for the federal budget, he made, it, uh, he made the federal budget online, receipt style, line item by line item, so we can see every single thing that's being spent federally. I think the county also needs to do that because, again, those are our tax dollars, not theirs. In the back. Yeah. <clears throat> Sir, it's easy to take a social problem and say, well, the solution is education, because you can solve any, virtually any social problem with education. Now, you want to take guys who are stealing cell phones, or hijacking, or robbing houses, you say, and your solution is to put them into school. But these don't sound like the kind of guys that are into too much book learning. Um, I don't think they like going to school. And what makes you think they're going to like your school? Um, I believe that the... I don't doubt that you're a good educator. Thank you. But, and I'm not even sitting in but these guys don't like school. So, um, I can tell you as an educator uh, that Chicago has failed a lot of kids uh, not catching learning disabilities early on, uh, teachers not teaching kids. I was, I was a victim of that in high school. I, I have a teacher that, that passed every single kid in his class when I was a sophomore in math class because he didn't want to teach us. Um, that is not a uncommon story at CPS. Um, we failed a lot of our kids and, it, and honestly it's our job to recover them. I explained earlier they're doing a lot of this stuff because there are no programs for them to go to. When I was a kid we had tons of programs. We don't have that anymore. Um, a lot of kids are doing this because we don't have jobs in our community. Um, 
a lot of jobs that I had growing up, from working at the movie theaters to flipping burgers. I flipped burgers before. A lot of those those jobs are going to adults because that's how much that's how badly our economic economy is doing. These kids have no programs, no jobs. So we're asking them to do what? You know? Again, we go back to the idle mind. They need stuff to do. They need money in their pockets. We can help them do that if we focus on that, on the front end, instead of, instead of focus on keeping them in prison when they make terrible decisions. Now, don't, gra don't get me wrong. The prison system should have people in there that are career criminals and people that commit violent crimes. But it shouldn't be people that made mistakes. One mistake. It shouldn't be uh, a place where we house mental ill people. It shouldn't. It shouldn't be a place where we, where we house uh, drug uh, addicted people. That is our current state of our jail system. And we need to change that. Then why not privatize it and have a company like Wackenhut come in and take it over? I can't, I can't say that. Why not privatize it and do what they do in Australia and have a company like Wackenhut take it over? You know what? Uh, our, our prison system is actually now currently pri uh, privatized. Um, every, anytime you, you say privatization of government services, I get nervous. Uh, I think parking meters, parking meters, parking meters in Chicago. Um, so I am not a fan of private privatization. I think there's a reason that public and private is separate, uh, and we should keep it separate. Because, uh, as you see with the parking meters, they they try to monetize something that we need. So I'm not a fan of privatization of anything governmental. <coughs> okay, back. Thank you for your presentation. It is uh, very good. One of the biggest contributing factors to the crisis of democracy that is nationwide right now is the lack of voter turnout. Um, it seems like a lot of people either didn't have a social studies class or they forgot why it was so important to them and their parents and their grandparents. Uh, all of us remember that feeling sometimes of uh, thinking back, wow, now we really see, especially now with what's in D.C. right now, for lack of a better word, leadership, uh, what happens when people forget how important social studies is. Uh, how do you see a lot of these issues uh, being a greater part of our effort to increase voter turnout when we do need more public schools? We do need more union halls. We need more libraries. We need more town hall meeting rooms. We need more public debate forum buildings. We need more freedom of speech forums like the college and complexes, which you can tell by being here tonight, we're on a spider web string, but uh, we have a new basketball arena for the DePaul Blue Demons. Now, I love basketball. I grew up loving sports. It's an important part of our, our lives. But uh, the United Center had already offered DePaul an opportunity to place all their home games there at a state-of-the-art sports is there a moderator here? Under this mayor, we are not seeing the minimum requirements of encouraging civic engagement in our public buildings. We have big box stores, we have sports arenas. Our largest buildings should be utilized uh, Jonathan, for this is. So how do you see, how do you see these John, issues being a greater part of efforts? What's the question, program? John? I didn't, I, I didn't hear the last part, I'm sorry. How do you yeah. see these issues uh, playing a part to prove voter turnout? Um, so John, uh, this doesn't look like a shoe, shoe string budget to me. You, you guys are doing well. Uh, compared to the DePaul, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm comparing it to the new DePaul basketball team. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm sure, let's say for example in Chicago history, if Fred Hampton were still alive, he would say we shouldn't be having this at Tiny Little Restaurant. We should be having this at the United Center or Soldier Field, because civics matters that much to everybody's family. If we had yeah. that money coming, we would well, love it. I'm, I'm asking the speaker, not anybody. Else. <laughs> uh, so I think I, I think I like where you're going so far. This with your philosophy. This has become this has become the norm, right? Um, voters are disenfranchised. They are uh, not mo motivated. Uh, because, I mean, we don't have good leadership. Uh, 
we have a being now being behind the veil. We have a uh, democratic system, a, de a democracy uh, that is unfair <coughs> and biased to people that have money. Uh, me personally, you know, I'm I'm going against a guy that can give himself a hundred hundred thousand dollars. You know, I can't do that. I can't even give myself a hundred dollars sometimes. Um, but that's what I'm going against. I'm going against machine politics, against people that have money. Um, I have another opponent. You talk about the basketball, you know? Uh, that is Pat Dow that did that. Um, and she used TIF money, which is actually used, supposed to be used for uh, areas that are in need. That's right. Impoverished. That's right. Say that. Um, and that's not being done. That's right. <clears throat> Anytime you think Navy Pier is an impoverished area, uh, and you and you spend money on a on a bigger Ferris wheel, we have a problem, <laughs> and that's why we're we're disenfranchised. I, I went up to a kid while while me and uh, Jim were going door knocking. Uh, he said, "Why vote? My vote doesn't matter. These people are gonna win anyway. I like you. I want to vote for you, but they they do everything." in their power to keep people like me from winning. Because they know I'm going to say something. They know I'm going to do something. I'm going to use my platform. Um, when I decided to run, I was told by several elected officials, you're too young. I said, I'm 35, I'm 34. I'm a, I'm a, I have a career. I have four kids and I'm married. When is time? They say, oh no, get under the organization, you know? Uh, and come up in that organization. Then they told me, oh no, this seat is promised to somebody. <laughs> and I said, you know, in, in, in return, I said, you know what? Uh, democracy doesn't work like that. The people vote. And so um, I started to run. I've been doing great. I have a buzz on my name and not a penny to my campaign pocket. Uh, we've been old school going door to door using what we have best, our two feet. Um, and I call, call such a stir, they have two machine candidates going against me. Two, you usually get one. They got two people getting funded by the machine. Against me, little old me, the guy with the spiky fro. <laughs> um, people are disenfranchised for stuff like that. You know, um, and once people like me start winning, and once I win and shock the world on March 20th, a change is becoming, not only to the county, but to the city as well. This is a quick follow-up. Yeah. From what I'm hearing, you're saying when, when canvassing is a big part of it, you like to energize the electorate by actually going into the community and talking to them, as opposed to what we currently have from some of the folks that I won't mention in the <laughs> It's a, it's a lost art. You know, I, I go door to door and people are shocked now. You're like, are you a politician? You're at my door for what? You know? Um, it's, it is a lost art. I love it because, again, my, if you remember my background, I'm a former community organizer. That is what I do. I talk to the people. And, and we need more people that want to do stuff like that, that want to talk to people, that want to be about the people, that want to serve the people. Thank you for your... No problem. Thanks, John. Okay. In back. I got a question and then you got a comment. All right. Uh, two parts. Yeah. Always uh, two parts. Why did it go from like six years, two billion to five billion? Can you, can you mention some of the specifics? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. So, uh, if you don't know this, that the, uh, you know, I'm very much pro union, but the union definitely runs uh, Cook County. Um, and every so often they have contract negotiations. Um, and you know the, the union, the the the, Dem the Cook County Dem Dem Democratic bosses to stay in power give a lot to the union. Um, I think another reason is patronage jobs. You have a lot of people helping people get elected for a hundred thousand dollar salary when they do nothing, right? Um, you have contracts. <clears throat> I was talking to a nurse at Providence Hospital uh, about a month ago, and she said that, you know what, uh, I'm not getting paid a lot, but they have these people they call 
weekday warriors. And so what these weekday warriors are, uh, they come in on Monday with their suitcases from flying in from out of town. They don't live in our state. Flying in from out of town. They work until Thursday, where Thursday at 5 p.m. you see them walking out with their suitcases and flying back to wherever they're from. These are people with contracts, people with our money in their pockets. A lot of that's going on on the county level. You know, um, yeah, they should be hiring state people. Yeah. Um, you know, I, when I, I, I've been all around the county. I've been in disadvantaged neighborhoods. I've worked in South Side, West Side, and all around. And then you know, got in jail. Uh, <laughs> I was in jail. Ah. I got in jail, right? <laughs> anyway, yeah. Anyway, you know, uh, these kids that, you know, it's tough to get jobs at steel mills and a lot of factories last over the years. And um, what a, uh, I always thought when I saw blighted neighborhoods, you know, buildings in bad shapes or littered yards or littered fields or, you know, whatever. Why don't they have, like, work, um, uh, work groups every day, you know, like pay a kid $100 a day and just have them meet in blighted neighborhoods and just have a bunch of those and clean up the neighborhoods and get them in good shape and you know, paint from blighted, blighted buildings and just get them looking a little bit, you know, a little nicer and then that'll attract, you know. Yeah, send somebody over to paint my house. Well, no, not a private <laughs> house, but you know, blighted neighborhoods. You know what I'm talking about, yeah, no. really rough looking, you know, get rid of bass fences, get, you know, do some yard work and, you know, hire a you know, thousand, couple thousand kids every day, give them a hundred bucks a day and, you know, there would be jobs. Because, you know, there, there's not a lot of jobs <clears throat> in the south side and west side rough area or rougher areas. And then, you know, transportation is a, a big issue getting out to a damn Schomburg, you know, yeah. where, where jobs are. Yeah. So, uh, to that I say, uh, great minds. Think alike. Um, one thing that I am proposing, yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing I am proposing is a prog program that we're calling a teaching trades program. Uh, so, uh, if you guys don't know this, that the Cook County has something called the Cook County Land Bank. Uh, what the land bank does is that they buy uh, those type of houses you spoke of uh, from the city and from the county. Uh, they pay the taxes and then they sell them off to developers to help development in communities that we speak of. Uh, in a teaching trades program, we will work side by side with the land bank program uh, to have a cohort of kids or young adults or whoever who applies uh, to uh, get a house that the land bank has purchased and use that house to teach this cohort of kids, young adults, ex-offenders, how to do skills such as carpentry or electrician work well, or masonry. They don't have to learn fancy skills, just, you know, well, yeah, I mean, just clean up and paint. I think that we don't want to put a Band-Aid <laughs> on a big problem. So giving somebody $100 to sweep up is a Band-Aid to a big problem. Well, what, we, what we want to do is we want to teach these people a trade uh, so they're, that, that uh, uh, immediately make them self-employed, where they can take that trade and use that skill to help somebody else, an uh, elderly person, uh, with their carpentry work at home. We want to give people, we want to teach people how to fish, right? Teach them how to fish so they won't have to look for any more handouts from the county or from the city. Yes, in the back. I've never worked with any of the people from Job Corps, and I also understand the unions are having a hard time filling their apprenticeships. <coughs> so I have I have worked with kids from the Job Corps. So I am a uh, uh, what I have what I did not say. I, I used to be a juvenile <coughs> uh, back when in, in my early uh, I, I might have been like 19. I was a juvenile officer, uh, and so um, the the place I worked for wasn't in Chicago. It was in Texas where I went to school at and when I went to college at. Uh, but I was a juvenile officer, and the juvenile facility was the juvenile facility detention center slash the job course center. 
Um, and it was called Gulf Coast Trade Center. Uh, and, and, and you guys look it up. It was state of the art. Uh, they had kids coming in. Uh, they were getting their GED. They were going to Job Corps and they were getting a skill. Uh, and they were leaving. Um, and so I don't know uh, their, their turnaround rate in terms of kids coming back. Uh, but I was there maybe two, three years. I didn't see a lot of that happening. Um, Cook County has probably the biggest juvenile center in the country. Um, we should be leading, leading the, 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 the nation in innovation because we're the biggest. But we're not. What does it have to do with Job Corps? Um, you asked me if i ever been to Job Corps. I told you I worked for a, or they had Job Corps. Um, and, and I'm proposing that uh, Illinois and Cook County start using Job Corps to fill some of those vacancies you said that they have. Okay, now those are the Job Corps vacancies. Mm -hmm. Now how about the union vacancies? Union vacancies. I'm not aware of union vacancies. Apprenticeships? Oh, apprenticeships. You know what? Um, I I think that I think that that the the apprenticeships that unionize uh, should look more towards for women and minorities. We don't have jobs. We want stuff like uh, women and minorities want jobs like that at times. Um, and I think that we should partner up with them to help help make that possible. When we go to Springfield uh, with some of the advocates that I go to to speak to our uh, local public officials, one of the top issues that's on the discussion for all the organizers is taxing the LaSalle district. However, one of the last topics that we could find a public official that will speak to us on record, uh, I don't know, other than Mary Flowers, and she is outstanding. Uh, Mary Flowers' leadership is very strong respect amongst all working class and middle class community uh, organizers that I know of. What is our biggest hurdle towards this becoming a big ticket item in the way that uh, you said you, you either work in the ministry or you're a, a minister? Yeah, I used, I used to be a young adult minister. So, Good note take. In, in John chapter 2, 14 through 16, if we could mobilize faith organizations and just recite John chapter 2, uh, ch uh, verse 14 through 16, I think yeah. we could get a lot of faith organizations to present it to the LaSalle district in a way that they're still going to be rich. They're just not going to be super rich. <laughs> yeah. um, and we could fund some programs that are long overdue that it sounds like under your leadership we're ready to go. We just need the money. He doesn't know that, Beth. Well, just, I'll, I'll say it during my rebuttal. I don't want to take up too much time because I'm more interested in your answer than my question. All right. Um, uh, I think uh, money and the church um, has been a, uh, a constant and recent issue. Uh, the Bible talks about how money is the root of all evil. Uh, and when you look at politics or LaSalle Street, uh, I would say definitely money is the root of those things. Uh, so there is a definitely a uh, clash of the two when it comes to that. Um, LaSalle tax. Uh, I think it's a brilliant idea, but it's also a state idea. Uh, can't do anything about that on the county level. Um, but, I mean, I, I, there's been a lot of talks uh, recently about a progressive tax mm. that I am also for. Mm. Uh, I think people need to pay their fair share. I think the problem with our city, with our county, with our state, is that we're giving a lot of breaks to people that don't need the breaks. Um, the breaks that, the people that need the breaks are the people that are poor. We need breaks. We need tax breaks. Uh, not somebody that can, that has a, a million dollar house or uh, uh, lives in a, a condo overlooking the city downtown. They don't need the tax breaks. We do. Uh, so maybe somehow come into a way where we can have a progressive system where people are paying their fair share. Uh, you, you will see a different state, a different county, and a different city. We got one in the back that went up. It better be a good question. It went up fast. You're calling for a progressive tax. 
And to get that, you need to amend the state constitution. You've already tried, <coughs> and it failed. Again, yeah, that, that is a definitely a state issue. Uh, if I was running for a, a, st a state representative or a state senator, I would I would definitely have something. So I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The trouble is, you have to pass a, a state constitutional amendment to get your progressive clearance. Yeah. So again, I I, I I could just only say I'm running for a county position. I can say what I'm kind of for and what I'm against. Yeah. Uh, that is definitely a state issue. Um, if I was running for state rep or a state senator, I'd probably have a detailed plan for you. But unfortunately, I'm, I'm running for a county uh, position. So um, again, I, I am pro-progressive. I think I am pro-fair taxation. I'm, I'm pro everybody paying their fair share. I'm just getting give, giving my beliefs. I saw a hand over here, right here. Yeah. Um, <coughs> you're gonna be on the county board. Would, uh, would you be for? Uh, County-wide support for BDS, regardless, you know, you know BDS. Say it again. No, I, I don't. Boycott, they, uh, divest, sanction. All contracts with Israel would be uh, boycotted or divestments from. Uh, does Cook County have uh, contracts with Israel? I'm just wondering. Yeah. So yeah, county has tons of contracts. Yeah. Um, you know, I am, I am actually against. Uh, I think if you if you if the county agreed to a contract, they need to pay up. Same thing with pensions. I, I don't believe in in this pension reform thing going around. I believe if you agree to pay somebody that worked 20, 30 years for you, you should pay up. Um, you we agreed to it, so we need to figure out some way to pay for it. Uh, same thing with contracts. Uh, I don't want to. I I know me. Uh, being uh, being a worker, um, I don't want to have to work somewhere 30 years and then you tell me, oh, I can't get my money that you promised me uh, when I took the job 30 years ago. Who wants to do that? Nobody. Um, so I am I I am pro paying people. Uh, if you negotiated a contract, you negotiated pensions. You we need to pay up. Back. Yeah, it's just what I write the union contracts and service chief negotiator and you said the way it sounded like you you want a lot of give back from the unions you want to cut salary and benefits out of the out of the workforce is that what you planning on doing that is absolutely not true um, I, I just said you know if you promise a, a union member something a union something they need to get it yeah, uh, that's that's include, that includes health care. Uh, that includes everything else that, that's promised to them. And, and this is again, I'm not endorsed by you, so none of the unions endorse me. That is, this is a personal feeling of mine. I have a wife that's a union member. I have a mom and uh, uh, and, and a grandma that were, that were part of union. I'm a union family. Uh, they're both. My grandmother was a teacher. My my mother was a teacher. Uh, my wife is a federal employee. They're part of unions. I, I, I've been on the, on the end, the brunt end of uh, not having a union to back me when it comes to a job and losing my job. So I understand the importance of unions. Yes? Uh, did you, uh, have you given any thought to what could be done about the, the problem with school closing uh, in certain neighborhoods where the kids have you know, basically no, no other place to go? Now, they, uh, I, I, from what I gather, uh, the African American community was heavily targeted for school, high school closures, especially. What, uh, what can be done about that? Do you think? Um, nothing on the county level. Uh, school closings are definitely a city level. Uh, they voted. They vote for it on the city level. Uh, the the mayor is some is kind of over that, and they have a uh, Chicago school board that, that that votes on that as well. On the county level, uh, only thing I can really do is use my platform to 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 go to disagree or agree to certain decisions that they make. I guess I would ask that you do you think there could be a solution to keeping some schools open? Would would that help the problem with uh, crime and uh, kids getting out of school early? Or? So let let me put on my educator hat, right? Um, the problem is, is why we have so many school closures on the south side and west side uh, is because we're losing population. Uh, 
anytime a school is under enrolled, under enrolled, uh, under enrolled. So under enrolled to a uh, CPS school is un under 250 kids. So or maybe two, 225. Anytime a school goes under enrollment of 225, they are up for closure. Uh, what's happening is, uh, and this is the county problem, that we're taxing people out of the, out of Chicago, out of their communities, out of the county. We've lost 700,000 people in the population <coughs> in Chicago. Out of that 700,000 people, we've lost $250,000, uh, not dollars, 250,000 uh, uh, African Americans. And not even that, there's a bigger issue. They're closing um, uh, uh, the, the, the housing. So the housing vouchers, you can't even get a housing voucher in Illinois anymore. They're saying, oh, you lost your housing voucher. Go to Iowa, go to Wisconsin. So we're pushing these people out through taxation and through policies that are not pro us. Um, that's the problem with schools. The, the, the south and west side, they're losing population. Because first of all, people don't want to live there because of the crime. They don't want to live there because it doesn't look good. They don't want to live there because they can't find jobs. And on top of those three, you're taxing the mess out of me where I can't pay them. That is why we have school closure. Yes, sir. Uh, people's gas just uh, increased their rates. And uh, it seems like they did it right in the middle of winter after the holidays when there was not a uh, genuine opportunity for dialogue between members of the community who would be most impacted by this uh, highly suspicious rating. So it really was not an opportunity to tell the folks whether this was really necessary. What's now the question, or not. Jonathan? And so, uh, it usually takes me about 20 seconds to give the, the follow-up. Uh, I'm listening. My question Go ahead. is: Is people's gas? It's pretty much a one percenter organization. I mean, you can't say that, but maybe, but I could say that. It doesn't sound like an organization that genuinely wants to have input from its own constituents. We want to get. Now, you know what? That that is one area that I, I'm I'm not well versed in. Uh, I don't know. If I, 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 I I look at my bill and I see my bill. <laughs> uh, but I don't know the reason why, so I don't want to speak on it. Uh, it could be a logical reason, or it could be what you're saying. I I don't know, uh, and, and you know I don't like to speak on stuff without the the, the wisdom and knowledge behind it. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. I thought about that. <laughs> but I am. I, I did notice that as well. Okay. Uh, the bill went up tremendously. That's right. All right. <laughs> I'd like to in the back. Yeah. What was uh, what was your position regarding uh, uh, our our county board president's push to uh, tax soda, soda uh, drinks, and sugar drinks. Um, well, uh, I am in agreement with her uh, that the county uh, should be healthy. Uh, we're spending a lot of money again on the back end in, in public in public health, uh, in diabetes, and heart attacks, stuff like that. Th those are serious issues. Um, one thing I am against, though, uh, the government shouldn't be in the business of telling people what they should and should not do. Um, that's where you get into a really slippery slope uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, the government. Um, I, was not, I was not for the, <coughs> the soda tax. Uh, I believe uh, the soda tax was masked over health, so, that, so the real issue wasn't health. I think the real issue was a money grab. Uh, they couldn't pay pensions. They had a uh, hole in their budget. And to fill that hole, they thought, what can we tax? Oh yeah, New York is over there. They're taxing sugar. Maybe we should do the same thing. If they really were concerned about our health, I wouldn't be able to get a pop from Providence Hospital, which I still could. I wouldn't be able to get a pop from City Hall, where, where the county office is. If they really were concerned about health, that, that stuff, they would have got rid of that stuff. Their vending machines would be super healthy. And then on top of that, um, pop is not the only thing that has sugar. If, if you live in the south side, you know kids love honey buns. They love flaming Hots. Uh, you look at the Wick office, they give a lot of pastas that turns into sugar. It's a whole reform that needs to happen. 
So if you're going to reform something, reform it fully. Don't reform it halfway and don't mask it to make it look like you care when you just want money to fill in, to fill in the budget gap. You had another question, you had your hand up again. Well, being sort of the devil's advocate, mm -hmm. if you're not for telling people how to live their lives, would that mean that you're against the tax on cigarettes? Um, I, I, am, I am against, I am, that is a great question. I've never thought about that. So, cigarettes is super bad for you. Again, but I do stand on that, that I am not the one to tell you that. Uh, I, I, I stand on that, so yes. Uh, cigarettes are bad for you. Uh, I've never smoked a day in my life. Uh, I heard nicotine is very, very addictive. It is. Um, but at the same time, I, I'm not one to tell you. I think what needs to be done shouldn't be a for it shouldn't be forceful. We should do stuff through education. I think me and you had that conversation that we should educate people before we try to force them to do something. Because because I, I have four kids. Anytime I force my kids to do something, it's rough. You know, especially with three boys. Uh, I like to sit down and educate my kids and say, this is why we're doing this. And, and even when I was a high school administrator, I sat down with my kids. I, I, think, I think of those kids as my kids as well. I sat down and said, these are why we have these certain rules. It was an easier transition if they have the understanding of why certain rules are, 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 are the way they are. Okay, uh, before we... Oh. One more quick question, then we'll go to Ray Bottles, okay? Uh, so, you, you, you know that uh, the soda tax is a regressive tax, and uh, you more or less said that, right? Yep. Um, and um, uh, kind of a hidden tax. Would you say the same thing about red light and speeding cameras, that they're basically a money grab um, masquerading as, as the good of the public? Well, that is city. And uh, I'm not speaking this on county, I'm speaking this as a citizen of Chicago and a voter. I do agree that those are regressive taxes. Um, there, there's people doing great work in that movement. Uh, Mark Wallace, I don't know if you've ever heard of Mark Wallace, but he has something called the 10 by 10. Uh, he, he, is, he has been challenging the legality of red light cameras. Uh, and he's winning. Uh, so if you guys get a chance, if, you, if red light cameras are an issue, please look up Mark Wallace. He's doing great work. Uh, he's also uh, on WBON. So great work, though. We got one more in the back. Okay. I don't like red light cameras because of um, the timing problem that can cause more accidents. So I'm against it, but I am heavily in favor of stopping speeders. I think you should uh, have a speed camera on every block. I, I agree. For, it would be great for revenue. There, there's Those a are people that are really causing problems. There's a difference between the red light cameras and the speed cameras. Oh yeah. Uh, my only gripe with the speed cameras are you need. To, I feel like that sometimes they hide the notion that the speed camera is coming, and they don't. It's okay. You're all operator. Also, 20 miles an hour. Give me a freaking. Yeah, you know. I mean, you, you, if, you, if you have to have a fair law, you know, and and, and if and if if you, what, what you have in the city of Chicago is. Uh, it can go from 30 to 20 by a block, real quick. So you need proper signage. You need to be fair to your citizens. Oh, yeah. I'm all about being fair. Speeding is the number one cause of car accidents. All right. <coughs> Let's. Uh, what I'd like to do now. Oh, I got. Wait. I got a question. Oh, all right, Andy. We got to get into rebuttals here. So. Well, let me ask my question. Then that. I. Uh, I'm Secretary of the Citizens Group for Public Transit. I haven't had a car in decades. It's very difficult to be a pedestrian in the city because people drive their cars way beyond the speed limit and they plow around the block. They turn left into you or they go through red lights. Is it our public safety of the senior citizens and the children who use the path, the sidewalks and the streets more important than this guy getting a ticket or this guy in his car chasing down senior citizens? <laughs> yeah. Do you care about no, senior no. citizens and children, sir, um, or not? 
I definitely care about children and senior citizens. Uh, that I feel like I feel like I feel like you, you got you guys got something some issues out there I need to handle much to say. Now shoot the fuck over there, shoot the Okay. Uh, let's go to rebuttals. All right. Give our, our, our speaker a big hand, please. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. You can take a seat and I'll listen and make notes, and then you get the last word to rebut what people say. All righty, cool. Okay. I love it. Thank, thank you, guys. Give us 10 minutes for a rebuttal after everybody uh, else gets started. All right. Thank you. Oh, thank you. This is awesome. Okay. Uh, is the mic working back there? Yeah, yeah it is. It is. It's not. It's not. I have well, hello. Anybody, uh, raise your hands if you want to give a rebuttal. And I'll get a count here. One, two, three back there. Four, five, six, seven. That's eight people. Okay. Eight minute rebuttal. Four minutes apiece. Oh, no, right. Yeah, four minutes apiece will do it, and it's a good deal. You have to show me how to do that. All right. I don't care. I'm just too many texts. Just because you're so low. Just the battery. The battery's run low. Just fine. You have to do it for yourself. Oh, I'm not saying that. All right, let's get speaking here. Start. Let's get started. How many minutes? Four. Oh, yes. Somebody could have given half a rebuttal by now. Thank you to our speaker. Uh, excellent presentation. Very well prepared. And it sounds like uh, in this era where there's a lot to be down about nationally, there's a lot to look at up to locally. Uh, this, this is Illinois. This is the state of Harold Washington. This is the state of Fred Hampton. This is the state of Slim Brundage. This is the state of uh, many examples on how to show leadership in America. One of the flyers I brought this evening it tells us what the opposite of leadership in America is right now on a lot of uh, people's minds at the dinner table every evening is uh, how our elections are rigged and uh, you know I'll surprise you it's not a flyer about the Russians or the fill in the blank another country it's about the GOP okay there's a long long history probably since Nixon a very unusual uh, election results discrepancies between the exit polls and the actual vote tally. So I, I encourage everyone to get this flyer in the back, How the GOP Rigs Elections by Ari Berman from uh, this week's edition of Rolling Stone. That's in the back. There's plenty of copies for everybody. Um, Josh, it's refreshing to hear a candidate who is running a campaign in which the energy of the campaign is generated first and foremost by ideas, vision, character, cooperation, and let's all roll up our sleeves, work and sacrifice, as opposed to big donors money. Uh, we need you now more than ever in Illinois Civics. Uh, we need an all for one, one for all uh, approach at the core of the turnaround we need. And the reason we need it is because in Chicago there's something very special going on right now where we're ready to join the industrialized world, looks like a lot sooner than a lot of other parts of the country. Now that's no disrespect, not to cast dispersion on the great uh, progressive states in the east, in the south, in the west, but I do feel like if we just go back to our roots, and I'll go back to the most radical roots, you know, I'm not going to water this down, I'll go back to Saul Alinsky. We need to tell people if we have this much money, 
then it should go first and foremost to the people who generated that money, the workers. Workers should be the prime beneficiaries of our work. So enough of the South, the South District, and the one percenters think they're going to come in and at the last second say how they worked for that money. No. This is Chicago, this is Illinois. Uh, it's all in place in the grassroots. Everybody I go with to Springfield, we went again this Wednesday to hear uh, the prevaricator in chief of Illinois, Mr. Brucey, tell us how trickle down economics works so well. Let's do it over again. So we've got the solutions. It's time to get voter turnout. People show up, people with leadership. So those solutions finally have a uh, day at the top of priorities. To finish, I'll read this. This is John chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, paraphrased version. <laughs> Rabbi, Rabbi Jonathan is here tonight. I, I appreciate y'all's indulgence. In the temple area, there were merchants and profiteers behind the counters. He made a weapon of self-defense, not of aggression, and chased them all out, scattering the money of the profiteers over the floor and turning over the tables. Then going over to the merchants, he told them, get these things out of here. Don't turn the people's house into the market. Uh, that's my time. Josh, thank you for reminding us that this is Illinois, the place that we love. This is Cook County, the place that we love, Chicago. And we refuse to let the 1% turn it into a market. Do you, do you think we could just turn the back thing off? Yeah, we're going to turn that back mic off. Yeah, well, I can't see And there's no banner. Where's the sacred banner? Where's the sacred banner? Sacred banner? Yes, my fellow. Just speak loud, okay? Okay. Um, thanks, Mr. Gray, uh, for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> first thing I want to mention is that uh, there were uh, no victims at Parkland uh, in Florida. I'm sure. I studied the Orlando shooting, the Sandy Hook shooting, I looked into the, La the Las Vegas shooting, and I should be putting quotes around all those shootings. These are hoaxes perpetrated by the government. They're monstrous, they're horrendous. Um, it's great that people aren't really being killed, but on the other hand, they're, they're playing a, a terrible mind game on us, okay? And the end uh, aim of, of theirs is to divide and conquer, pit people against each other. Now it's white supremacy, now, then, then now it's Muslims, now it's gays against, uh, or, or anti-gays against gays, with, like in Orlando, et cetera. That's what they're doing. And ultimately also, they certainly want to take uh, weapons away from the, the people because when the revolution comes, they might be handy for the people. But that's all I want to say about that. Um, secondly, I, you're, you seem to be a good, hearted progressive, and I would certainly vote for you. Uh, except that I wouldn't vote for Jesus Christ, I wouldn't vote for Martin Luther King, or anybody else, Mahatma Gandhi, nobody, okay? Because as most of these folks know, I'm against elections in general, and I'm against the representative system in general. I myself was a community organizer um, in, when I was younger. I worked for UNA, United Neighborhood Organization, that was before your day. I also worked for ACORN, which I'm sure you know about. <coughs> Um, and I decided uh, a long time ago that reform was not enough. We have to go an, an entirely different way. Uh, getting people together and, and, and beating up on the politicians to do the right thing uh, ultimately is not getting the change that we need. We have to change the system. It's systemic. <clears throat> How is it um, that, uh, okay, you say we need alternatives to incarceration. We, we need a lot of programs. We need this and that. Why aren't those things in place already? You mean to tell me nobody knew that uh, people needed jobs? And now uh, Mr. Gray and other progressives uh, have to be put into office to enlighten uh, the rest of the government? Progressive, uh, assuming Mr. Gray is progressive, I don't know him that well, but from what I can tell, those kinds of politicians are always a tiny minority. Always. In every uh, large legislature. Maybe in some tiny town where you, know, you, you could get some good people, but in a large city like Chicago, a county like Cook, uh, a state like Illinois, the government, the federal government, the vast majority of these people are hacks, out and out tools of, of the rich and the corporations. Worthless. How could you have 
uh, Republicans running uh, so many state governments, the majority of state governments. How can you have a Republican Congress and a Republican uh, 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 presidency? The system is utterly worthless. It's, 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 it has to go, the entire representative system. We cannot have a situation uh, like, like we have and then, and then try to fix it. It's like fixing a broken down car. You get, uh, you know, a, a 1950s uh, beat up car, rusted and everything. You have to get rid of that crap and, 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 and start with a new car. Um, what, else, what else should I say? Um, Dylan and Page, um, two professors at Northwestern University, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's their name, they did a study which everybody should actually know about. They should have been headline news. Um, ordinary people, they found out scientifically uh, that ordinary people had no impact on politics at all. Uh, their decisions or opinions about um, what should be done in, in, in society were like random noise. The, the, the government, staffed by politicians, always did what the rich wanted. So how can we have uh, what, what um, a, a quote-unquote democracy, you, said, you mentioned um, we have a, a, a democracy biased toward rich people. That's, I, I would, I, I, I concur with the sentiment, except that you should have democracy in quotes. We do not have a democracy, because if we did, it wouldn't be biased toward rich people, it would be ordinary people with power. And that's what I ultimately, am I getting to time? Okay, let me just, let me just uh, sum up really, really quickly. What we need is an actual democracy with legislative community assemblies of ordinary people gathering together and make, making decisions, and executive councils, uh, random sample councils, uh, uh, so that we would have actual people, I mean ordinary people at, in the, at the legislative end and at the executive end. That would be a real democracy. Thanks. Yes, uh, I have nothing against somebody in the Democratic Party trying to get elected, but they might be progressive, that's good, but that's not the answer to our problems. You take the Republicans and what I call them the Democrats, and they both serve the same people. The billionaires, the millionaires, Wall Street, Wall Street the banks, and the, in, the big industrials. That's who they serve. So how, I don't care how many progressives you get in there, it's not going to make a real big difference. What we need is a third party that represents the people in the United States that work for a living and are not parasites. You take a capitalist, he's a parasite. He lives off of somebody else's labor. That's how he makes his money. And if somebody else didn't work for him, he wouldn't be a millionaire or a billionaire. So we got to have people that represent just the average working people. And I see by the last election, you had Bernie Sanders who ran and he got all his money from just the ordinary people. And I think there should be a third party, a new vehicle to represent the people without property, without great wealth, and people that own own banks and are not imperialists around the world. And until you have that, it's not going to make a real big difference in the problems that we, that we have. For instance, we just had these killings in Florida, and of course it's been going on now for so many years. So what are we really seeing is the decline and fall of the American empire. Because we live in an empire. And the United States has uh, more or less followed Nazi Germany. We become the Fourth Reich. And that's what the, uh, the government in the United States represents. And no matter who you have in there, like we had Obama, for instance. Now, most people thought, well, most African Americans are progressive. 
So automatically they thought Obama would be progressive. But he was no more progressive than Clinton was when he was president. And Clinton was the third way, they said. And what did he do? He came in and said, if you don't uh, work for a living, you're not going to get no more relief, you're not going to get no food stamps, and you're not going to get any subsidies. And he put a lot of people into poverty. He moved to the right. And Obama, when he came in, he says, I'm for change and for a more, more or less more popular outlook. And it didn't mean anything. It was so general that it was meaningless. And the programs he carried out was no better than the Clinton programs. And what he'd done in different parts of Asia, especially the Middle East, he used drones to kill people. They're after this leader and that leader, he's a terrorist. So they see a whole bunch of people around there in one area, and the drone drops a bomb on them, and what were these people doing? They were going to a funeral for somebody that was killed by the United States with a drone. Yeah, and that's how we yeah. create more terrorists. Or people that have that people that hate Okay, let us know when you're gonna start. I'm ready. Okay, shot. Alright, so um you know, some nice points by the speaker tonight, well spoken. Uh, and uh they gonna say the the you know if he figures out a way to bust Mayor Daly on his stupid parking meters. <laughs> Everybody needs that deal. <laughs> and, and it follows the money on that because you know it's a monopoly company that's taken over this whole. They're so corrupt, and the Mayor Daly family's involved. Is Ram? Who told us that Ram owns part of that company, or his brother owns it too? What a joke. But if you can bust Rahm and, and, uh, and Daly on the parking meters, because they're taking over more territory, raising the rates, screwing the residents, and it's all going to Wall Street and all these crooks, corrupt jerks. Anyway, and plus, you got to get Alice Cooper's I Want to Be Elected is your main song. <laughs> elected, selected. Good song for elections. Anyway, I forgot what it was. Get out of here. Leave Charlie alone. I'm still going to say something. I wrote this poem several years ago. It still fits in. Love guns are needed. Americans have armed themselves well. Any threat can be destroyed by shooting it and killing it. With a gun, the fastest is the best. Get them before they get you. Problems, under misunderstanding, destruction, broken lives, pain, hurt, and death. We need to arm ourselves with a love gun that shoots loving kindness bullets to help heal the pain recover and reconnect with each other. Some will require multiple shots of loving kindness to help soften hardened attitudes and fears. These bullets are softer to act than bullets of lead. Well, these are not really bullets, but tiny fingers that can touch the heart. But they're longer lasting and some once touched with loving kindness will be suspicious. But after being touched multiple times, they'll get the message. We're all in this together. There's work to do, to know and to heal the hurt and deal with each other's pain. With a love gun, you're interested in the connection with the heart. Instead of blood, there are tears. 
with a love gun, you know there is no suffering, and you are included. With oh, both guns, yeah, there's yeah. pain. But death in one direction, new life in the other direction. With justice and peace, we're fully known. Who wants it? You want it? Uh, we'll make them later. Okay. Okay. Is this a clock? Okay, there you go. Uh, a minute and a second. Yeah. Um, uh, Jonathan had uh, um, brought up a quote from the Bible. And uh, I think there's a more appropriate quote for uh, your situation. I think it's more like David and Goliath. So um, I, uh, I admire what you're doing, and uh, I wish you the best of luck. Um, a couple of things I want to just throw my opinion out about. First is um, the first is uh, uh, jobs. In the 30s, FDR had kind of a similar problem on a national level, all this joblessness, and he started the WPA program where he was hiring people and literally creating jobs. And um, and not sure if that really helped a huge amount economically, but it sure gave people uh, uh, a boost up that they felt, I think, emotionally. And, uh, and I just wonder if maybe the city can just sort of declare the certain part of the city or the county, say, Here's an area that needs a tremendous amount of help. Let's start up a jobs program like the WPA. Um, I think it's gonna. I think it would be really uh, helpful for uh, at least, if not economically, at least the spirit of the people who live in those areas. Um, another issue is uh, you were talking about um, uh, not being a Minnesota tax. Um, and although you recognize it was a big health problem, um, I would disagree and say uh, from you, you were saying that the, that we shouldn't interfere in people's lives. I mean, that's what laws are. Uh, my opinion is that um, the big problem is really political. It's the same reason that the government had problems a long time ago when cigarettes were really popular and they just started jacking up taxes. We had a bunch of nicotine addicts who were coming up with excuses to say why it was unfair. And the bottom line is cigarettes are healthy and sugar is unhealthy. And sugar, the thing about sugar pop is it is, it's all sugar. There is no <laughs> nutritional value to it. It is so solely to hook into people's natural inclination to their desire to consume three different products. It's uh, sugar, and salt, and caffeine. They just have this natural uh, human desire to eat this. It's just biological. And, the, co and the, the companies, they've done research. They've identified this. They're engineering the food to to click into people's unconscious biological desire to consume this stuff that has no nutritional value. So well, I think it's uh, it might be politically hard to confront people on this, but um, it's uh, I think it's the right thing to do. And then there's the added benefit of re raising revenue because we need revenue. Um, and then finally, uh, there was some discussion about red lights, red light tickets, and I was standing in the back and Charles was going off about how this is horribly dangerous for pedestrians. He was pointing over his shoulder and he was pointing at me. <laughs> he kept pointing at me. All right, that guy in the blue hat. So, so my comment to Charles is, if you don't like the way I drive, stay off the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my message to Charlie when he told the gentleman in the blue hat to get out of here. Don't shoot the piano player, Charlie. The poor devil's doing the best he can. 
Uh, second of all, with regard, to, and I want to thank the speaker for a very informative and interesting presentation. Uh, with regard, however, to the soft drink tax, I would say the following. The county does need the revenue. And originally, I don't know that anybody was against it. Then the soft drink lobby mounted a propaganda campaign whose like has not been equal since the days of Joseph Goebbels or since Stalin's last propaganda chief. <coughs> and the bottom line here is that's why the soft drink tax was defeated, period, end of story. The only caveat I would add to that is I have no objection to opposition to the soft well, let me put it this way. I have no objection to the soft drink tax. But I would rather that Michael Bloomberg had kept his mouth shut and stayed out of what is a Chicago matter and not New York's business. I don't think it I don't think his his insistence on funding the commercials, I don't think that helped. And finally, you spoke of local government being more important than the federal government. This has already been talked about. The late Speaker of the House, Thomas P. Tip O'Neill, always used to say, all politics is local. Yeah, All right, let's thank our speaker. And thanks, Jim, for coming out tonight. I'll be eclectic as usual. Uh, local government isn't my specialty, but in the time honored tradition of the college, they will not preclude me from speaking at all. I'm sure I'm knowingly about all of this. Uh, Cook County uh, apparently has increased its budget since the old man uh, was running it, a uh, soldier, uh, two and three times, as he indicate. I have some reason to believe that this is an aspect of government that perhaps is more tilted, how can I say, uh, tilted towards political uh, manipulation and operation and less the civil service type of operation. Um, in, in the East Coast, uh, or in a number of years, the counties don't exist. Uh, and in other parts of the country, uh, counties are the most important form of government, especially rural areas. In the Midwest, we have something of a blend, so it's difficult at times to figure out. Nevertheless, I feel that the county government is the last vestige, perhaps of patronage, uh, and needs perhaps to be looked into. Now, there's two things I think about when I think about Cook County. That's the operation of the, the jail and the operation of their hospital. Therefore, the two areas that I think candidates for office would focus on would be crime, as we heard of tonight, and the other one, the issue would be public health. Um, and what can be done about this. Another thing is I, I heard that a great deal of services are contracted out. Contracted out also can be misused as a reward for uh, political patronage and campaign contributions. That's how the Republican Party operates, at least on the federal level. The other thing is you have to watch out, and we heard tonight, about PPP, public-private partnerships. Uh, this is being, it went disappeared for a while, but then again it's coming back, particularly through the uh, federal government and the Trump administration. Public-private partnerships are being looked upon as the way to go for, for the involvement of the business and to attract the investment of the business community and in order to sell them our infrastructure. But nevertheless, thank you very much for an informative campaign. I hope if you do get elected and that you will see to it that there are more speed cameras yes. and red light things mm -hmm. so that the seniors and the children of the county of Cook can have a long and healthful life. Thank you.
Thank you. Never mind the mic. Again, thank our speaker. Uh, I would like to thank our speaker for giving a, a good presentation, uh, a common sense presentation of problems that are faced by people all across the city. Uh, in general, though, what nobody has seemed to mention, uh, there is money to be used to solve all these problems, all, all the different problems that people have talked about tonight can be solved by going after two sources of money. Collectively, our money is being spent in two places. Number one, we support, or rather, we don't get a chance to vote on it. The largest killing machine in the history of the human race, which is the U.S. military industrial complex, with 800 bases all over the world, a trillion dollars a year budget, and Trump wants to raise it 10 to 20 percent more. Martin Luther King was famous, one of his famous quotes was saying, any society that spends more money on machinery to kill people and the machinery of death than it spends on social programs is approaching spiritual death. And that's what we're seeing all over this country. And that book I showed you earlier, uh, Lost Connections, talks about when you, the suicide rate goes up rapidly when people sense that they have no future, no viable future. Also, our country, our young people, many of them involved in these school shootings, are on antidepressant drugs that have just one small side effect nobody's talking about. One day you wake up and you're homicidal or suicidal after uh, being not depressed for a while. The other place we're spending the money is the total militarization of America with Homeland Security and the militarization of the police that stems from one single event that was sold to us as a terrorist attack. If you don't take away anything else from what I say, remember this number, seven, number seven. Seven buildings were leveled with pre-placed explosives on the morning of 9-11. Seven buildings, not two. The media had, the billionaires that orchestrated that had the cameras and the media set up. They filmed the destruction of the first two buildings and sold it as a terrorist attack by 19 crazed Muslims. This was done to motivate the American people to support the military moving into oil-rich countries all over the world to control the world's oil resources because in 1998, it became obvious to them that the future belongs to solar and wind power. Since then, solar and wind power all over the world have dropped to the point where they're cheaper than fossil fuel everywhere in the world. The future belongs to solar and wind, but we have billionaire fossil fuel predators that don't give a shit about any human life anywhere on the planet as long as they can make their billions. That's the Koch brothers, people that are on Exxon, Chevron, British Petroleum, you name it. Their motto is, well, we're sorry we destroyed the Gulf of Mexico, but it's not personal, it's just business. We're sorry we, we have to destroy the Alaskan uh, wilderness, wildlife refuse, everything else, but there's oil up there. Our profits are more important than human life, animal life, and the survival of the planet. That's where we are. We address those two issues, the issue of billionaire predators and the issue of our military industrial complex. We whoops, we can free up, a, free up a couple of trillion dollars a year to provide free universal health care, free universal education, decent housing. We wouldn't have homeless people sleeping everywhere. You could take care of veterans like they are in all other modern industrialized countries. Okay? If anybody wants any more information for this, feel free to see me afterwards. Incidentally, the two sites that I get news from <coughs> that are linked to hundreds of other good sources are commondreams.org and truthout. I think truthout is a dot .org also, but it's common dreams and truthout. Those are both sites that are run with no advertising. They have the best of the best. Any so that's it. Is there any other rebuttals or Let's get the speaker, speaker gets up the last, last word? word. All right. Yeah.
Yeah, what are you going to do about 9-11? I'll make it real quick. You have uh, at least 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Yeah. I'll probably need all 10 20. minutes in my minutes. I'll just set a clock for you anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, I want to honor your service as a, as a former community organizer to another former community, uh, community organizer. I, I, I want to honor your service. Um, uh, John, I appreciate the Jesus talk on Saturday. I appreciate that. Gets me ready for Sunday. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons that I decided to uh, not be a community organizer anymore, uh, because I woke up and I realized that I was begging, I, I was begging elected officials uh, who had the power for services uh, and got tired of doing it. Especially when I thought I was smarter than them. I was better than them. Uh, so what did I do? I picked up a clipboard, got some signatures, just to prove that I'm better than them and that, that we don't have to beg, we can take now. Uh, so I plan to take this seat and make sure that we get services as county residents. We don't actually have to be the minority. It doesn't take us to starting another party. We can take back the party that's supposed to be for us. If we elect more people that think, are innovative, and are nonpartisan in their thought pattern. I think what happens is that when you have partisan, Republican, Democrats, you get a stalemate. And, we become, and, and the government becomes unproductive because you, you, you lack the vision or innovative thinking that comes along with being a partner and not having everybody still have to agree with you. Uh, one thing about David and Goliath that was mentioned uh, and how my race is like David and Goliath, uh, but I just want to remind everybody that David did win that fight. <laughs> so I, I will take that David and Goliath uh, uh, um, compliment. Uh, in closing, I say this, parking meters bad, speeding cameras, eh, and when I win, I will play Alice Cooper song, period. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>